Hi, so my piece is called Accelerated Aging. Observing time's accretions, rejuvenating, speeding up and turning back, modifying behavior, transforming, and above all, protecting. The title I chose for today is an, as a kind of an attempt to define my two backgrounds. One is a conservator and one is a visual artist. But focusing on this event has given me time to examine the intersection of these two strands. And in doing so, I'm confronted with a bit of a block. So instead of trying to identify an intersection, which suggests a single moment, a better description would liken my practices as parallels that occasionally combine and coalesce. So it's reasonably clear on one level how my fine art practice benefits from my training in conservation with its emphasis on materials, process, behavior, but less clear for what or where that exchange is in conservation, as I can't really define it just yet, except that it has brought me an even deeper appreciation for the works of art that have survived. Um, perhaps also resonance with the you know, drive to create. A considerable challenge I find is that I have a tendency to think laterally for a solution and literally from years of close examination and definition. In time, I hope to be able to use this to my advantage or at least to hone the skill and adapt it as it can lead to unrealistic expectations and frustration. And when this invariably happens, these plans have to be dry docked temporarily to avoid overexposure and death by dissection. And I start anew with something familiar, but semi-forgotten, and hope that it will spark a new thread. And so I see a tangle of threads, all connected, but there isn't any order. Conservation entwined with visual art, and they need time to be teased out. If you pull it, it'll break. If it's forced, it only makes it more compacted and difficult to untangle. The urge I have to find an answer or a route through can end up feeling like I have a lot of loose ends in my hands. So time to give in and take it slowly as there are no shortcuts to be had. So I'm particularly delighted to be able to see in Brian's the most recent future, a desire to see what is underneath, to look so closely that new details present themselves. Each crack in an age varnish acknowledged and painstakingly documented. And above all, the celebration of the aging process as a thing of beauty and intrigue in itself. It immediately brought Japanese uh, scroll conservation to mind. The Japanese conservation studio works on a very strict delineation of roles, where the apprentice begins somewhere near the paste making duties and eventually progresses up the hierarchy through to documentation. After that, the route to master scroll mounter is vague to an outsider such as myself. The apprentice plots out each crack and tear in a scroll. I admit that when I saw this in action, it struck me of how beautiful the work looked and so obviously painstaking. And I wondered whether the scroll would have been repaired a lot quicker if another route had been taken. But this step was required in the Japanese tradition to truly understand and one that couldn't be eliminated for the sake of expediency. I can remember being overwhelmed at the sight of the scale of the task being undertaken. Two young conservators kneeling over a light box, inching along at a slower than snail's pace. This left a huge impression, and not long after I, find myself, I found myself doing a similar exercise back in the National Gallery of Ireland, an experiment in distilling and translating damage the character of a handmade sheet of paper with its all so-called so imperfections and yet so perfect and precious. A handmade sheet of paper is valued because of the way it's formed, the deft action of the paper makers ensuring the fibres are interlocked to provide a very strong and flexible sheet. The work in question was a copy of Raphael's School of Athens by an unknown artist. And at that time, back in 1998, I think I crossed a line briefly between documentation and something else by, by transcribing the minutiae of marks onto a fresh sheet of paper. How many sheets of paper had been joined almost imperceptibly to make the hole? And then the insect holes, minor and major tears, areas of skinning, abrasions, accretions, surface dirt, tide marks, creases, dents. The list went on. I chose a beautiful red pencil, 
in response to the sanguine chalk. I think I might have entered a kind of visual art limbo wherein I had to wait for a decade before I could really say that I had crossed the line wittingly and willingly. In Brian's delicate drawings of the complex cracular on the surface of Vermeer's painting, he appears to expertly flip this to make the barely visible visible and then taken to a new level of abstraction. You can still read the former subject as darker pigments absorb more light and thus are subject to higher levels of deterioration as light equals energy and some form of, en some form of energy is still required for decomposition. So that now on one level it documents what has been slowly happening ever since Vermeer stepped away from the canvas. Which kind of reminds me of the term invisible mending, used to describe the way of repairing using thin, toned and discreet repairs. And they're only used if the work of art is compromised or disfigured to the point of causing illegibility. But still, we always leave a clue as conservators that this is an addition to avoid undermining any authenticity. In my practice as a visual artist, this term has spawned an element of trickery and subterfuge where the clue is foreground as an invitation to look closer and question what you see. In recent work, I conflate scalloped nets, as in net curtains, with oyster shells, bringing themes of protection and disguise into play. By the way, cockling is a word in conservation used to describe the distortions, or usually the gentle rippling effect that paper can exhibit when it's been uh, subjected to humidity or uneven constraints. And it always brings shells to my mind. I really admire how Brian's drawings invite you in to try and comprehend what you are looking at. Is there a pattern? What is the pattern? What does it signify? To me, it is also like a sleight of hand. Once you see it, it can be understood. It is right under your nose. You just need to look at it differently. In Brian's works, which examine the drawing and painting process of Mani Jellet, he selects only the damages and stains and applies her process of translation and rotation foregrounding the damage as it takes on a life of its own. Which brings to mind another favorite term, fugitive inks, suggesting an elusive life of imaginative, inanimate things, a latent life force, or foxing, which is used to describe the brown colored freckles that you can see appear on a piece of paper. A term we use at home, perhaps in everybody's, meaning faking and trickery. A little bit about process, and aside really, I'm, pr I'm prone to falling down a process-based rabbit hole, being, becoming consumed by materials and methods, behavior, steps, and traditional ways of doing something. Another reason why, as a conservator, I first gravitated towards print. But the most obvious connection is time, in the many imperfections, stains, and accretions, and residues. And I define and highlight while the work of art becomes the passive victim. And also, as been mentioned before, the slow creating, slow looking, steps which allow time to reflect. And this is common, I guess, in very many artist practices. Mine is punctuated by bursts of obvious and overlooked clarity. And this leads to another term of, of, uh, of mine that I use in conservation called accelerated aging. And this is a method to kind of determine the future aging characteristics of a mechanism or a material and is to gain a better understanding of the implications of treatment and how it will work to provide stability to a work of art. It's how we test new materials and technologies to access their suitability and predict their long-term applications. It relies on a controlled environment and standardized conditions to assess the impact of external factors. And I've adopted, adapted and adopted this process to introduce, or induce deterioration rapidly in photographic negatives by converting the silver nitrate particles suspended in the gelatin emulsion to a silver sulfide, also known as silver mirroring. So using wax as a resist, I've made drawings on recycled X-ray negatives and, ex and selectively exposed the drawings to pollutant gases in a temperature controlled humidity chamber. The formation of silver sulfide on the photographic surface produces a beautiful multicolored shine suggesting something precious rather than the damage or evidence of deterioration that it is. I've been mainly talking about the links I see between conservation and fine art, and I'm gonna just mention a few differences maybe. In many ways, I see a differentiation in the ethical responsibility of doing as little as possible in conservation. We use the term minimal intervention, 
and it's a direct contrast to doing as much as possible as I do in my artistic practice, which combines print, sculpture, film, and installation. I describe myself as Baroque rather than minimalist. Likewise, you can't have an ego in conservation. You are completely and utterly in the background with all focus on the work of art. And so this allows my fine art ego space to grow, a bit of balance or yin yang. Whereas now, I suppose, where I would be best described as hovering, trying to find the sweet spot where either harmony or fabulous discord is found. Some days I resent the way I write in the passive voice, as per my training, where sentences might begin with, there appears to be evidence of photooxidation, or the drawing has been adhered to a secondary acidic support. And other days I can just be really mesmerized by metamers, which is the ability of pigments, especially blue, to appear a completely different shade in light. Just telling me that everything is just waiting to be looked at from another angle and appreciated for a different reason. <laughs>